And in the midst of it, I had a revelation. It was God. He says, hey, Richards. That's what he calls me. He wants to teach me something. Yes, God. He said, you know what that bull calf just did to you? Yes, God, I'm sitting in it. Thank you very much. Master of the obvious. And he sat there and he says, that's what you do to me every time you sin. <laughs> Don't tell me these things, God. You see, I want to see sin as, oh, yeah, I took another cookie out of the cookie jar. Sorry. Uh-uh. Sin is hurting someone who loves me and gave his life for me. Huh? When we come to Christ, when we're baptized, we give our life to Jesus. He's the good shepherd. And he puts us on our, his shoulders. And the only thing he wants is for us to get home and be at heaven with him forever. He wants us to have peace forever. And yet we kick him, we urinate on him, we do all this stuff and say, let me down, I'll do it my way. I'll do it my way. See, don't you get it? The center of sin, if you spell sin, is what? I. S-I-N. The center of all sin is I. And see, that's the point. Somewhere, we got to give up the eye and trust someone that loves us. Huh? And so now is when it starts getting a little intense. Because we have to go back now to where Christ gave up everything for love of us. We're at the Last Supper, and as we're at the Last Supper, there's Jesus. There was no altar there. They didn't have little hosts, little crosses on. Jesus didn't stand there, and they all didn't kneel down and say, the body of me, the body of me, the body of me. He sat there, they had bread that they picked up or they made that day, regular unleavened bread. They had wine, not just one glass, four glasses. Jews know how to party. And they're sitting there, they're at the Passover. They're reclining at table, meaning they're sitting on the ground. The altar was a table a foot high, and they're reclining along there. So much that that's how St. John the Baptist, uh, John the Baptist, who was already dead, St. John the Evangelist could put his head on the chest of Jesus because he was already laying there. They were laying there. It wasn't like you see in the, you know, the Da Vinci's or whoever is thinking, there he is there, and, there and, and John reaches over and shut up. It has nothing to do with reality, huh? And so here they are. Jesus is taking this, and then he says, take this. This is my body, which will be given for you. Then he says, this is the cup of, well, now it's chalice. And I'm sure he didn't say chalice then. But anyway, he said, this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be shed why for the forgiveness of sins so what would it cost Jesus to forgive us tonight his blood his life and see it cost him everything and so it got to be more to us so he sits there and after he had the Last Supper it says the only time in recording the scriptures in Mark's gospel it says after singing hymns of praise the only time recorded Jesus Christ ever sang was after the Lord's, the Last Supper. He knew he was gonna to be tortured, but he didn't just sing, he sang a hymn of praise. Then he takes his, they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, which he loved to pray, and I got to be there this fall, in Gethsemane, and here's this, it's this thing, and you can see Jerusalem over there, and it's over to the side, and there's these olive trees and everything, but anyway, he sits there, and that's where he loved to pray. And so he took three of his best friends, Peter, James, and John. It's okay to have best friends, Jesus did. And he says to them, my heart is broken unto sorrow. Watch and pray. Now, do you get this? Jesus is saying, my heart is broken. Jesus died of a broken heart. My heart is broken. Just be with me. Can you imagine if you're dying? Tonight's your last night on earth. And there you are in the, in, the, in the hospital, and you have your best friends, and you just say, I am so afraid. I'm just so afraid. Be with me, please. That's all he's asking. My heart is broken. Be with me. And then he goes and he falls down. And he says, Abba, Daddy, please let this cup pass him by. He begs his father that the cup would pass him by. Again, we dismiss it. We make all this very simple. You know, I had a guy, I gave this talk in Detroit, and he says, no, in the mystical city of God, says he, 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 didn't, he didn't experience. That's garbage. Jesus, it says in God, Mark's gospel, the word back in the Greek is stupefied. You know what stupefied means? Paralyzed with fear. That's how afraid Jesus was that night. And when he cried out to his dad, I don't want to do this, that's what he meant. 
But then he said, not my will, but yours be done. If you want me to do this, this is what I'll do. But in the midst of that, he wanted, he didn't want to be alone. He wanted his friends, so he went over to his three friends, which he said, watch and pray with me. And what were they doing? Sleeping. Could have cared less. They were more concerned about them than they were about him. How many of us do the same thing? We're more concerned about us, whether I get to sleep in on Sunday, whether I have to go and do this, than we are about Jesus. And he says, you can't give me one hour. You can't give me one hour. One hour I've given you all my life, and you can't give me one hour. And he says that to us week after week. You can't give me one hour. It's too much. Is that really too much to ask? And then he goes back to his father. Father, please let me, please let this cup pass me by. And again, it says he was so afraid that he sweat blood. And again, it's a rare occurrence, but it's been shown someone can be so traumatized that their capillaries will burst and they'll actually start sweating blood. Jesus was so traumatized, he sweat blood. Please, Father, let this cup pass me by, but not my will. And he kept going back looking for support three times. He looked for support from his friends, and he looked for support from his father. And he felt alone. Can you imagine? He knew it was going to happen to him. But he said the last time, your will be done. He taught us how to pray. Your will be done. Not mine. If this is what you want, that's what I want. And then there was silence. Broken only by the snoring of the apostles and his beating heart. And he could look towards Jerusalem. And as he looked towards Jerusalem, he could see a cohort coming towards him. You know how many people were in the cohort? Anywhere from six to nine hundred men. More people that are in this church tonight. And his heart beat faster. And faster. And finally the gates open. And as the gate opens, out comes Judas and out comes all these men. Now the apostles are afraid. They wake up. Our big, strong Pope, our first Holy Father, St. Peter, pulls out a sword, and he doesn't start fighting with any of, the, any of the soldiers, not Peter. He cuts off the high priest's servant's ear. <laughs> and Jesus looks at him and says, Put away the sword. And you can almost hear him, not scripturally, of course, you can almost hear him saying, Peter, I needed you to be with me five minutes ago. But you, wouldn't, you couldn't even stay awake to be with me. You promised to take care of me. And now that your butt's in the sling, you cut off some kid's ear. Put away the sword. And Peter dropped the sword. And what did Peter do? He ran. And every apostle ran too, leaving Jesus alone. Oh, I'm sorry. He wasn't alone. Judas was there. And the 900 men. Judas went up to Jesus. He embraced him. And he kissed him. And Jesus' heart was broken. And he looked at Judas and said, you would betray your master with a kiss. And his heart was broken. It was crushed. Sometimes we wonder, I, I, I wonder if Jesus understands my pain. No. I wonder if we understand his. Not one of us have loved the way Jesus loved. Jesus loved Judas with the love of God. And not one of us have been betrayed to death. Jesus was betrayed by someone he loved to death. And his heart was crushed. It was broken. And then they go and they tie him and they take him to three people that night. The high priest, Herod, and Pilate. When they take him before the high priest, the high priest says, Are you the Son of God? And Jesus says, I am, and you will see the Son of Man coming, escorted by all his angels. And the high priest goes nuts. Shema Israel, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And here's Jesus claiming to be God. Huh? And so he says, he must be put to death. They sent him to Pilate, said, Pilate said, this isn't my problem. Send him to Herod. Herod's in the middle of a drunken orgy. So they said, let's have some fun with the prophet. And so they tied Jesus up, they spit on him, they kick him, they beat him. And after they were done having their fun, Herod says, send him back to Pilate. 
Pilate's wife had a dream, have nothing to do with this man, have nothing to do with this man. So he doesn't want to do anything with the man, but he has to do something. So he says, okay, let him be scourged. Now, people of God, you have any idea, if you saw the movie, the Jesus of Nazareth or the Passion of the Christ, it's a little bit different what I'm going to tell you, because he got all his stuff from all these other people. This is about as close as you can get historically. Jesus Christ, when he was tortured, was naked. When he was on the cross, he was naked. Now, some people say that the Jews had an arrangement with the Romans that they would, because the greatest humiliation was for a Jew to be naked in public. Hmm. The Jews are the one who sent Jesus up. Not all Jews, of course, we're not talking about Jews are bad today. Come on. This is back then. And so here it is. So they didn't mind. They wanted him to be humiliated. So here he is, naked, 33 years old. In the center of the courtyard is a wooden pole. At the wooden pole is a round ring of steel. Then there's two centurions with the instruments of torture in their hand. Long wooden dowels about this big. At the end of the wooden dowels are long, thin pieces of leather. At the end of each piece of leather is a ball of metal. In the ball of metal, embedded all the way around the ball of metal, is a razor-sharp piece of sheep bone. Two inches down from each of these balls of metal with the sheep bone all around it is a one and a half to two and a half razor-sharp piece of sheep bone. And they hang. Jesus is naked there, one centurion's there, one centurion's here, and they take turns. Whack! Ah! And then this guy backs up. And then the other one comes, and he comes up and goes, Whack! Ah! And see, what happens is when one guy hits him on the back, the other, he turns this way, and the other guy comes and hits him in the front. So, as this is happening, it's not just like a piece of rope hitting a piece of a marble. These balls of metal with the razor-sharp pieces of sheep bone gouge out chunks of flesh. That if you were to look at Jesus, it would be shredded flesh because they beat him 33 times. And as they beat him, he went back and forth. Ah! Ah! <laughs> back and forth. Beat all over his body. And then right before... The Romans had it down to a science as how much a person could take. And at 33, they dropped him. And when he fell, he fell into his own flesh and blood all around him. Huh? And yet, it was prophesied by the prophet Isaiah 750 years before. He was wounded for our offenses. He was scourged for our sins. Upon him lays the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes, we were healed. It should have been me. It should have been you. And yet that was Jesus for us. And when he fell, they kicked him. Get up, Jesus, get up. And he stood up. It was almost impossible for him to stand. Then they blindfolded him. And as they blindfolded him, they would kick him. Get up, Jesus. Come on, prophet. You're a prophet. Who needs you, Jesus? Slap. They'd slap him in the face. Hey, Jesus, who slapped you in the face? <laughs> they would spit on him. Hey, Jesus, prophet, who spit on you? Can you imagine what it would be like if you're naked, you're blindfolded, and you're pushed from person to person? You don't know where the next kick or the punch is going to come from. And that's what Jesus went through. Then after they had their fun with him, they go, wait, wait, wait. He didn't just say he was a prophet. He said he was a king. Well, every king deserves a crown. So they take off the blindfold so he could see it. And they make a crown. Nothing like that. It was really a cap. And the thorns would be out like three inches. You know, we look at crucifixes and we say, isn't that beautiful? Really? That's what it's become? A piece of jewelry? Oh, isn't it beautiful? Uh, the only thing beautiful about it is love. But if you were to look at it, you would turn your face. You would never look at what he went through. And so anyway, they take this cap and they put it over his head. And then they place it on him. And what it is, they say again in Mark's Gospel, they took a reed. And what they do with the reed? They hammered it on his head. So here's this cap of thorns, about three inches big. 
They put it on his head, then they hammer it on. Now what happens, of course, is some of the thorns break when it hits the skull. Some scratch and go through and puncture the skull. Some pierce his ears and it scratches all the way down and some, of course, puncture his eyebrows. And the head bleeds more than any other part of the body and the blood comes rushing down into his face, his eyes, his ears. And as they hammer this on, the pain, can you imagine the pain? And as the blood gets in his eyes, it starts to make his eyebrows stick together. He can't see. And when he can see, he has to look through these thorns. And they continue to torture him. Morning comes. Pilate calls him in front of everybody. There are thousands of people. Thousands of people. They got the prophet. They got the prophet. They got the prophet. And Pilate calls him forward. And there's Jesus standing. And Pilate says, behold the man. And there's the God of gods, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. It doesn't even look like a human being. His eyes are all puffed up. He has his crown of thorns on him. His eyes, he has to open them with his fingers so he can see. The blood is all over him. His white garment is no longer white. It's sticking to his body because the scabs and the wounds have become one. So if you were to look at him, he'd be all beat up, horribly beat up. He'd have this white garment on him, all red and bled brown, and it'd be sticking to him. He didn't even look like a man. Again, the prophet says he looked like a worm and not a man. And Pilate, after he says, behold the, the man, he says, what should I do with your king? And the people cry out, crucify him, crucify him. What? Should I crucify your king? Crucify him, crucify him. And every time we sin, every time we sin, we're in a crowd and we cry, crucify him. Hey, Jesus, you're going to like this one. I like doing this sin. Every time we sin, we cry out, crucify him. No big deal to me. I'll go to confession on Saturday. Father's night nice. was a big deal to him. Every time we sin, we cry out, crucify him. And Pilate says, let him be crucified. Now again, like most stations of the cross you see in the movie, he did not carry the whole cross. The vertical part of the cross was already in the ground at Calvary. He carried the horizontal part of the cross. huh? And as he carried this, it was made for each person. And so it was a little bit wider than his arm span. About this wide, about this thick, and a little bit longer than his arm span. And they would tie this to him. Now remember, Jesus was tortured all night. And now he has to carry this big piece of wood. Now remember, he can hardly stand. And he has this big piece of wood on him. So he starts to walk and what does he do? He falls. And as you go to fall, when we fall, what do we do? We put our hands in front of us to stop the fall. Jesus' hands were tied to the wood. So when he fell, what stopped the fall? His face. So bam, he'd fall. His face would hit the dirt. His piece of wood would bang him in the back. And he would kick him, get up, Jesus, get up, get up. And Jesus would try to get up. It was impossible for him to get up. They'd have to lift him up. And then he'd fall back to the other side. And this happens again and again. They get Simon to help him carry the cross, the Cyrenian. And as they carry him, Jesus is still carrying the cross. But Simon's keeping it above and trying to keep it balanced. He falls for the last time. It's either 9 in the morning or 12 in the afternoon, depending on what scripture, what gospel you look at. But while he lays there, they untie him from the piece of wood which he was hoping wouldn't happen. Because normally that's the way they would pull you up to the cross and they would tie you to the cross. You could be there for days. But sometimes they wanted to be particularly cruel. Jesus, they wanted to be particularly cruel to. So they untie him from the piece of wood and they move the piece of wood. And remember I told you he was naked. He didn't have that loincloth on him. We put that on him so you don't have to look at a naked man. That's why it's there. But he was naked. So here he is laying there. And what do they do? They rip off the garment. Now remember, you ever have a band-aid that's stuck with the hair? Or it's stuck with the scab? And when you're a kid, you say, oh, mom, take it off. Ah! Well, this whole garment had become one with all the scabs on his body. And when they ripped it open, they ripped open all the scabs. And there he is laying there naked, and they drag his naked body through the dirt so the dirt would get up into the newly opened wounds. 
And they place him on the piece of wood. One centurion takes this arm, the other centurion takes this arm, and they pull him taunt. And then they take a six inch nail, and they put it not in the center, but the bottom of the palm, this way, into the wrist. But it's still in the palm. And then they would just sit there. I want you to try to get into the mind of Jesus for a second. He looks over and he sees his arm out. And he sees a nail right there. And he watches it go in. Bang! 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 And as the nail goes in deeper and deeper, the blood squirts out and his arm starts to spaz. Then they pull this arm out and he can't even look this time. And they put it there. Bang! 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 And then they take the rope and they put it around the wood. And they have a pulley at the top. And they pull Jesus up. But what pulls him up to the cross is the nails. Can you imagine your whole body being pulled up by two nails? And then they pull his body to the cross. They take one foot and put it on top of the other. And they take a nail and bang! 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 Now his whole body spazzes in pain. This is my body for you. This is my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. And for three hours he hung on the cross, huh? You know what you die of on the cross? You die of suffocation. Because as long as Jesus could hold up his body, he was fine. But when he got weak and he fell down, it would cut off his air. And so if you're watching Jesus, you see this 33-year-old naked man, pieces of flesh hanging all over, blood all over, and he'd start falling, and he'd start to suffocate. <laughs> and have to pull up against those nails to breathe. That's why in three hours, it's only recorded, he said seven phrases. And he pulled himself up. <coughs> Father, forgive them. I don't know what they've done. It fall. <laughs> I thirst. Jesus thirsts for you. Do you thirst for him? Or are you just Catholic? It's just as good as any other religion. It's no big deal. I go to church. It's no one religion is good to the other. This isn't about religion, it's about Jesus. He thirsts for you. Do you thirst for him? And then it fall. <laughs> And even on the cross, he keeps, keeps giving and giving and giving. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Isn't it amazing? He didn't say, after a thousand years of purgatory, you little pagan, then you're going to go. He says, today, you will be with me in paradise. And then he fell. And then mystery of mysteries. When he who knew sin became sin, whatever that means, theologians have argued about it, people go back and forth again and again. Whatever that means, when he who knew sin became sin, God the Father could not look at him, and he turned away his face. When he turned away his face, Jesus Christ cried out, My God! My God! Why hast thou forsaken me? Even you, Daddy, even you. So that one of us could ever look at Jesus and say, you don't know what it's like. You don't know what it's like to feel far from your father. You don't know what it's like. He knew what it was like before you were born. But again, even now, he gives the latest, latest and greatest great gift he could. He gives us his mother. He looks at her and he says, woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. And John took Mary into his care. John always represents the whole church. Have you taken Mary into your care? Do you have devotion to the mother of God? That was the last thing. Mary was the last thing he gave us. Or are you one of those modern Catholics and say, I don't need Mary. No, it's no big deal. If you don't really care about mother, then this is what you do. You come up to the crucifix and you go, <coughs> and you spit on him because you reject the last and greatest gift he ever gave you. He said, behold your mother. You need to take Mary into your care. And then he looks down at the devil and he says, it is finished. You no longer have power over my children. Then he looked at his father and he says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And then he dies. For you, for me, 
This is my body. This is my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. And when he died, the earth shook. Thunder, storm, lightning. Everybody ran except for the women, of course. Thank God for the women. And they're there with Mary and John was there and someone took a spear and speared his heart. The birth of mercy, the birth of the church. And then they take him off the cross and he falls into his own blood, his own flesh. But also because when a person dies, everything lets go. His own urine, his own feces. The God of the universe in a pile of feces. Then they drag him over and they place him in his mother's lap. And there's Mary and she holds her son. And as she holds her son, she starts rocking him and she wails. Because <laughs> she remembers when he was only about Oh, two weeks in Bethlehem, and Jesus would cry in the night, and Mary would just hold his little body and say, Shh, Jesus, it's okay. It's okay. Mommy's here. Mommy loves you. And now she's just holding the dead body of her son going, Shh, shh, Jesus, it's okay. It's okay. And she'd grab one of those hands with a horrible hole in it, and she'd pick it up and she'd kiss it. Mm, it's okay, Jesus. She'd bend down and kiss his feet. She'd put her, put her hand in his chest and she'd kiss the chest. It's okay, Jesus, it's okay. Because she remembers when he was just about four years old and he scraped his knee and he'd come running over to his mom and he says, Mommy, Mommy, I scraped my knee. And Mary would break, fall down on her knees and pick up Jesus and say, It's okay, Jesus. And she'd kiss his knee and say, See, I made it all better. It's okay. It's okay. As she holds the body of her son it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> she remembers when he was about eight years old, and he came running to her in the middle of the night, and he says, Mom, ah, I had that nightmare again, man. Mom, I had the nightmare. Mom, why they want to kill me? What I ever do to them? What I ever do to them? And she'd pull him into bed with her and go, Shh, shh, Jesus, it's okay. It's okay. Mommy's here. Mommy loves you, huh? Well, she holds on to the dead body of her son. You know, sometimes we wonder, ah, uh, I wonder if Jesus loves me, you know, because he hasn't given me everything I wanted. You know, my life has been hard. My life sucks sometimes, and I don't even know if God exists. I don't even know. So you ever get like that? Well, you go to Mary if she holds the dead body of her son and say, oh, yeah, Mary, I saw the movie Jesus of Nazareth. I'm really touched, yeah. But this all has to do with me anyway. Mary, I want to know something. Mary... Do you think that he loved me? Because he hasn't given me. My life's been hard. So Mary, do you think that your son loved me? And you look at her, look at you. And you see the hurt and pain in her eyes. And she cries out and she says, My God, what more could he do for you? Look at him. Look at him. He's dead. He's dead. And he died for you. What more could he do for you? He gave you everything he has. He has nothing left to give. How dare you? How dare you ask me if he loved you? He gave everything he had. He has nothing left. What more could he do for you? What more do you want from Jesus Christ? The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the God of the universe, become a baby. He was poor. He lived a life like any of us. He did all that we do except sin. And then he died a horrendous death for you and for me that we could live forever. For you and for me that we could be forgiven forever. For you and for me that we could be sons and daughters of the Father. He has nothing left to give you. Nothing left to give you. Have you ever once in your life, ever once, thanked him for what he did? Or have you just taken it for granted, like the first night we're here and we read the story of the bridge? And we've been on that train having a happy time. Oh, yes, yeah, someone died for me. Yeah, big deal. He is right here and he's alive. Now would be a great time. Those who want, 
just kneel with me and in your heart, you thank him for what he did for you. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us so much that while we were still sinners, you died for us. Jesus, thank you for dying for us. Thank you for loving us. Jesus, you gave your life for me. May I live my life for you. May this day forward I live a life of gratitude because you loved me and gave your life for me. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.